morning. Today is April the 26th, 2020. Today's Sunday School lesson topic is what goes around comes around. Our scriptures for the day will be Isaiah chapter 61 verses 8 through 11 and chapter 62 verses 2 through 4. With our background scriptures, Isaiah chapter 61 verses 8 through 11 and chapter 62 verses 1 through 12. Let us pray. Father God, we come here today thanking you for allowing us to be with you another day. We thank you that you have given us a peace of mind, joy in our heart. You've just given us salvation. We thank you for our salvation, Father God, and we do not take it lightly. We thank you that you've given us this day so that we can be a light to you for others to see. It's not about any one of us, but it's all about you, Father God. So this day, we come to give you all the praise and the glory. We thank you and we ask that you just protect each and every one of us, protect our family members. Father God, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior's name. Amen. Introduction. What goes around comes around. We have all heard the expression, what goes around comes around. Just last week, Sunday School Lessons illustrated about Esther, this remarkable truth so effectively. In Esther chapter 3, Haman had been promoted to a position, and he expected all the king's officials to bow before him when he passed. But there was a certain Jew named Mordecai who refused to bow or show Haman any respect. This outraged Haman, who decided that it was not enough to have his revenge on Mordecai alone, but rather he would destroy all the Jews. So Haman convinced the king that all the Jews, young and old, women and children, should be killed on a single day and the property of these killed Jews would be given to the persons who killed them. There was great fasting, weeping, and wailing when Mordecai and the Jews found out about this decree. It seemed hopeless for Mordecai and the Jews. Haman was even now on his way to ask the king to impale Mordecai on a 75-foot pole that Haman had prepared just for Mordecai. But remember the day's topic is what goes around comes around. So in chapter 6 of Esther, the king wanted to honor Mordecai for helping stop an assassination attempt on him since nothing had been done to honor Mordecai. Ch Esther chapter 6, verses 3 through 11. If you have your Bible, turn to Esther chapter 6, verses 3 through 11. And I'll be reading from the New Living Translation, which says, What reward or recognition did we ever give Mordecai for this? The king asked. His attendants replied, Nothing has been done for him. Who is that in the outer court, the king inquired. As it happened, Haman had just arrived in the outer court of the palace to ask the king to impale Mordecai on the pole that he had prepared. So the attendants replied to the king, Haman is out in the court. Bring him in, the king ordered. So Haman came in and the king said, what should I do to honor a man who truly pleases me? Haman thought to himself, whom would the king wish to honor more than me? So he replied, if the king wishes to honor someone, he should bring out one of the king's own royal robe, as well as a horse that the king himself has ridden, one with a royal emblem on his head. Let the robes and the horse be handed over to one of the king's most noble officials, and let him see that the man whom the king wishes to honor is dressed in the king's robe and led through the city square on the king's horse. Half the officials shout as they go, this is what the king does for someone he wishes to honor. Excellent, the king said to Haman. Quick, take the robes and my horse and do just as you have said for Mordecai the Jew who sits at the gate of the palace. Leave out nothing you have suggested. So Haman took, out, took the robes and put them on Mordecai, placed them on the king's own horse and led him through the city square shouting, this is what the king does for someone he wishes to honor. And our verses, those verses were Esther chapter six, verses three through 11. So of course this was humiliating for Haman, but God's not finished yet. Esther chapter 6 verse 13 tells us, When Haman told his wife Zeresh and all his friends what had happened, his wise advisor and his wife said, Since Mordecai, this man who has humiliated you, is of Jewish birth, you will never succeed in your plans against him. It will be fatal to continue opposing him. That was Esther chapter 6 verse 13. Again, the topic is, what goes around, comes around. Haman had plotted to destroy all the Jews, 
But Esther pleads to the king for her life and her people. Esther chapter 7, verse 3 through 10. And I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. It says, Queen Esther replied, If I have found favor with the king, and if it pleases the king to grant my request, I ask that my life and the lives of my people will be spared. For my people and I have been sold to those who would kill, slaughter, and annihilate us. If we had been merely sold as slaves, I could remain quiet, for that would be too trivial a matter to warrant disturbing the king. Who would do such a thing? Such a thing, King Xerxes demanded. Who would be so presumptuous as to touch you? Esther replied, That wicked Haman is our adversary and our enemy. Haman grew pale with fright before the king and the queen. Then the king jumped to his feet in a rage and went out into the palace garden. Haman, however, stayed behind to plead for his life of Queen Esther, for he knew that the king intended to kill him. In despair, he fell on the couch where Queen Esther was reclining, just as the king was returning from the palace garden. The king exclaimed, Will he even exalt the queen right here in the palace before my very eyes? And as soon as the king spoke, his attendants covered Haman's face, signifying, signaling his doom. Then Harbana, one of the king's eunuchs, said, Haman had set up a sharpened pole that stood 75 feet tall in his own courtyard. He intended to use it to impale Mordecai, the man who saved the king from assassination. Then impale Haman on it, the king ordered. So they impaled Haman on the pole he had set up for Mordecai, and the king's anger subsided. Again, our topic, the lesson topic is, what goes around comes around. Another instance of what goes around comes around is in Daniel chapter 6, verses 1 through 24. So if you have your Bible, turn to Daniel chapter 6, and we'll be reading verses 1 through 24. And I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. Daniel chapter 6, verses 1 through 24 says, Darius the Mede decided to divide the kingdom into 120 provinces, and he appointed a high officer to rule over each province. The king also chose Daniel and two others as his administrators to supervise the high officers and protect the king's interests. Daniel soon proved himself more capable than all the other administrators and high officers. Because of Daniel's great ability, the king made plans to place him over their entire empire. Then the other administrators and high officers began searching for some fault in the way Daniel was handling government affairs, but they couldn't find anything to criticize or condemn. He was faithful, always responsible, and completely trustworthy. So they concluded, our only chance of finding grounds for accusing Daniel will be in connection with the rules of his religion. So the administrators and high officers went to the king and said, long live King Darius. We are all in agreement, we administrators, officials, high officers, advisors, and governors, that the king should make a law that would be strictly enforced. Give orders for the next 30 days, any person who prays to anyone, divine or human, except to you, your majesty, will be thrown into the den of lions. And now your majesty, issue and sign this law so that it cannot be changed an official law of the Medes and Persians that cannot be revoked. So King Darius signed the law. But when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he went home and knelt down as usual in his upstairs room with his windows open toward Jerusalem. He prayed three times a day, just as he had always done, giving thanks to his God. Then the officials went together to da Daniel's house and found him praying and asking for God's help. So they went straight to the king and reminded him about his law. Did you not sign a law that for the next 30 days, any person who prays to anyone, divine or human, except to you, your majesty will be thrown into the den of lions? Yes, the king replied. That decision stands. It is the official law of the Medes and Persians that cannot be revoked. Then they told the king, that man Daniel, one of the captains from Judah is ignoring you and your law. He still prays to his God three times a day. Hearing this, the king was deeply troubled, and he tried to think of a way to save Daniel. He spent the rest of the day looking for a way to get Daniel out of that predicament. In the evening, the men went together to the king and said, Your majesty, you know that according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, no law that the king signs can be changed. 
So at last the king gave orders for Daniel to be arrested and thrown into the den of lions. The king said to him, May your God, whom you serve so faithfully, rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den. The king sealed the stone with his own royal seal and the seals of his nobles, so that no one could rescue Daniel. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night fasting. He refused his usual entertainment, and he couldn't, he couldn't sleep at all that night. Very early the next morning, the king got up and hurried out to the lion's den. When he got there, he called out in anguish, Daniel, servant of the living God, was your God, whom you serve so faithfully, able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel's answer, long live the king. My God sent his angels to shut the lions' mouth so that they would not hurt me, for I have been found innocent in his sight, and I have not wronged you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and ordered that Daniel be lifted from the den. Not a scratch was found on him, for he had trusted in his God. Then the king gave orders to arrest the men who had maliciously accused Daniel. He had them thrown into the lion's den, along with their wives and their children. The lions leaped on them and tore them apart before they even hit the floor of the den. Again, what goes around comes around. We have all experienced a time in our life when it seems as if some people have, make, have it made so easy in life, while God's children seem to never get ahead. Why does it seem as if the wicked prosper while the righteous suffer? Well, Psalms chapter 73, verses 1 through 28 tells us, and I'll be reading from the New Living Translation, the verses again is Psalms chapter 73, verses 1 through 28. Truly God is good to Israel, to those whose hearts are pure. But as for me, I almost lost my footing. My feet were slipping, and I was almost gone. For I envied the proud when I saw them prosper, despite their wickedness. They seem to live such painless lives. Their bodies are so healthy and strong. They don't have troubles like other people. They're not plagued with problems like everyone else. They wear pride like a jewel necklace and clothe themselves with cruelty. These fat cats have everything their hearts could ever wish for. They scoff and speak only evil. In their pride, they seem to crush, seek to crush others. They boast against the very heavens and their words struck throughout the earth. And so the people are dismayed and confused, drinking in all their words. What does God know, they ask? Does the Most High even know what's happening? Look at these wicked people, enjoying a life of ease while their riches multiply. Did I keep my heart pure for nothing? Did I keep myself innocent for no reason? I get nothing but trouble all day long. Every morning brings me pain. If I had really spoken this way to others, I would have been a traitor to your people. So I try to understand why the wicked prosper, but what a difficult task it is. Then I went into your sanctuary, O oh God, and I finally understood the destiny of the wicked. Truly, you put them on a slippery path and send them sliding over the cliffs to destruction. In an instant, they are destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. When you arise, O oh Lord, you will laugh at their silly ideas as a person laughs at dreams in the morning. Then I realized that my heart was bitter and I was all torn up inside. I was so foolish and ignorant, I must have seemed like a senseless animal to you. Yet I still belong to you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, leading me to a glorious destiny. Whom have I in heaven but you? I desire you more than anything on earth. He is mine. My health may fail and my spirit may grow weak. But God remains the strength of my heart. He is mine forever. Those who desert him will perish, for you destroy those who abandon you. But as for me, how good it is to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my shelter, and I will tell everyone about the wonderful things you do. What goes around comes around. In a world where the wicked seem to prosper more than the righteous, the believer's eyes must be fixed on God and God and his goodness. God can give the believer a proper outlook on life and eternity. This perspective would dominate the believer's life only when one constantly focuses on God, trusting and holding on to God and God alone. 
This is our background and our introduction. We will now go through our verses of our lesson. We will start with Isaiah chapter 61, verses 8 through 9. If you have your Bible, turn to Isaiah chapter 61, verses 8 through 9, which says, now we read it from the King James Version for these verses. Isaiah 61, verse 8 through 9 says, For I, the Lord, love judgment. I hate robbery for burnt offerings, and I will direct their work in truth. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them, and their seed shall be known among the Gentiles, and their offspring among the people. All that see them shall acknowledge them, that they are the seed which the Lord hath blessed. That was Isaiah chapter 61, verses 8 through 9 of our lesson. When we see the word I, we know that this is personal. I, the Lord. I, the Lord, guarantees us that God is a God who loves. Love is a choice of the will that God makes to display his deep commitment to his people and to show his approval of a specific kind of favor action. In this case, the action is judgment. Judgment means to pronounce something good or evil. Another way to say it is to pronounce something right or wrong. Verse 8 tells us that the Lord loves judgment. We often try to imagine a God who is love, and he is, but God is not indifferent to sin. What kind of father would God be if he did not deal with sin? God's wrath against sin is real, even as his love for his people never fails. His love for us is to direct us in the way that we are supposed to be. God is just, and he loves to see his kingdom coming and his will being done here on earth as it is in heaven. And our God is a God who hates the robbery and wrong of the world today, just as he has always hated it. Malachi 3 and 8 tells us, Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But you say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offering. God already owns everything. So when we rob from God, we are really robbing from ourselves. On a physical level, when we don't give our all to God, it goes to somebody else. Many people have already made plans for their stimulus check without including God. But once they receive the check, then they find out that it goes to someone else. Your car starts acting up. The body shop gets the money. Now you have to go to the doctor. So the doctor gets the money. Your check is already gone because you did not include God. On a spiritual level, when we rob God, we rob ourselves of spiritual blessings that comes from obedience and faith. This is who God is. He loves what is right and he hates what is wrong. Those who are fully committed to God's moral standards of justice will receive from God an appropriate response, an everlasting covenant. How can we know that this covenant is everlasting? Well, if you have your Bibles, turn to Hebrew chapter 6, and we'll read verse 13 through 18a. That's Hebrews chapter 6, verses 13 through 18a. And it says, and I'll be reading from the New Living Translation, it says, For example, there was God promised to Abraham. Since there was no one greater to swear by, God took an oath in his own name, saying, I will certainly bless you, and I will multiply your descendants beyond number. Then Abraham waited patiently, and he received what God had promised. Now when people take an oath, they call on someone greater than themselves to hold them to it. And without any question, that oath is binding. God also bound himself with an oath, so that those who received the promise could be perfectly sure that he would never change his mind. So God has given both his promise and his oath. Those two things are unchangeable, because it is impossible for God to lie. God can be counted on to do this because he acts in faithfulness, truthfulness with those he loves. Jeremiah 29 and 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Jeremiah 29 and 11. God pledges himself and binds himself to us so that he becomes our God and we become his people through Jesus Christ. God's promises are everlasting and he confirmed that promise with an oath that can never be broken. Yes, we have made this world a mess, but the good news is that God will not accept defeat. 
Despite Abraham's failures and sin, God kept his promise and Isaac was born. Many of God's promises do not depend on our character, but on his faithfulness. Deuteronomy 31 and 8 says, Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord will personally go ahead of you. He will be with you. He will neither fail you nor abandon you. Our God will never fail us or abandon us. That was Deuteronomy 31 and 8. Isaiah 59 and 21 tells us, And this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit will not leave them, and neither will these words I have given you. They will be on your lips and on the lips of your children and your children's children forever. I, the Lord, have spoken. That's Isaiah 59 and 21. This will be an eternal covenant relationship with his people. All the world will acknowledge God's blessing to Israel. Other nations will notice the uniqueness of Israel's descendants and recognize Israel as the one that the Lord has blessed. This promise is, though, is not limited to just Israel's natural descendants, but to all spiritual children of Abraham, all believers in Christ, the church. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 through 18. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 through 18 tells us, Don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews, who were proud of their circumcisions, even though it affected only their bodies and not their hearts. In those days you were living apart from Christ, you were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel, and you did not know the covenant promises that God had made to them. You lived in this world without God and without hope. But now, you have been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God, but now, you have been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people, when in his own body on the cross, he broke down the walls of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of law with his commandments and regulation. He made peace, peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from two groups. Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross. And our hostility toward each other was put to death. He brought this good news of peace to you Gentiles who were far away from him and peace to the Jews who were near. Now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. Those verses again were Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 through 18. Because the church today shares in Israel's spiritual riches, anyone who puts faith in Jesus Christ shares in this new covenant of being born into the family of God. And those blessings are for all posterity. We will now turn to Isaiah, continue our lesson with Isaiah chapter 61, verse 10 through 11. That's Isaiah chapter 61, verse 10 through 11. And it says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decked himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorned herself with her jewels. For as the earth bringeth forth her bud, and as the garden causes the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. Those verses again from our lesson are Isaiah chapter 61, verses 10 through 11. So in response to God's righteousness, love, and everlasting commitment, the proper response should always be praise. We should praise God for what he has done for us, and the speaker now praises God for dressing his bride in beautiful red garments. Israel used to be dressed in ashes of disgrace, which they earned. But now God, in his mercy and love, has given Israel a new set of clothes. God has clothed Israel with the garments of salvation and covered Israel with a robe of righteousness. Salvation is referred to as the inner dress or garment, while righteousness refers to the outer coat. In Isaiah time, clothing really did make the man. Your outer appearance reflects one's inner being. But God didn't just close Israel. God, through his son, Jesus Christ, has closed all his believers. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 through 27 says, For a husband, this means love your wife, just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, 
washed by the cleansings of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. That was Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 through 27. Revelations chapter 19, verses 6 through 8. It tells us, Then I heard what sounded like the shout of a vast crowd, or the roar of a mighty ocean waves, or the crash of loud thunder. Praise the Lord, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reign. Let us be glad and rejoice, and let us give honor to him. For the time has come for the wedding feast of the Lamb. And his bride has prepared herself. She has been given the finest of pure white linen to wear. For the fine linen represents the good deeds of God's holy people. That was Revelation chapter 19, verses 6 through 8. This is how both of these verses illustrate that Jesus Christ is going to close his church, his believers. Our clothing indicates our transformed lives that result from our relationships with Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 13 Verse 11 through 14 tells us, the verses are Romans chapter 13, verse 11 through 14. And it tells us, this is all the more urgent. For you know how late it is. Time is running out. Wake up, for our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is almost gone. The day of salvation will soon be here. So remove your dark deeds like dirty clothes and put on the shining armor of right living. Because we belong to the day, we must live decent lives for all to see. Don't participate in the darkness of wild parties and drunkenness, or in sexual promiscuity and immoral living, or in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, clothe yourself with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And don't let yourself think about the ways, about ways to indulge your evil desires. That was Romans chapter 13, verse 11 through 14. We should stop putting on the clothes of our past, for we now have a new teller. He has clothed us with the clothing of salvation and draped us in a robe of righteousness. And that's not only the new clothes that he has given us. If you have your Bible, turn to Ephesians chapter 6, and we'll read verse 10 through 17. Those verses again are Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 17, which says, the New Living Translation says, a final word. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Sound your, stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. In addition to all those, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrow, arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Colossians also, Colossians chapter 3 Verses 5 through 14 says, So put to death the sinful earthly desires lurking within you, having nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. Because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. You used to do these things in your life when your life was still part of this world, but now is the time to get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. Don't lie to each other, for you have been stripped off of your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. In this new life, it doesn't matter if you are Jew or Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free. Christ is all that matters, and he lives in all of us. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must close yourself with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, close yourself with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. 
Those verses were Colossians chapter 3, verse 5 through 14. We have a new tailor, and our new tailor is clothing us and telling us how to dress. God does this for his own praise and glory before the nations as a witness to his almighty power. Verse 11 tells us that when rain falls on the soil, shoots will grow from the seeds that were sown in the garden or fields. In a comparable way, the Lord will cause his seeds of righteousness and praise to spring up from people as a response to the gift of salvation. The praise of God will be heard by all the nations. We will now turn to our next last part of our lesson, which is Isaiah chapter 62, verses 2 through 4. But I'll be reading Isaiah chapter 62, verses 1 through 4. So if you have your Bible, turn to Isaiah chapter 62, verses 1 through 4, which says, For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest, until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness, and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness, and all the kings thy glory. And thou shalt be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. Thou shalt also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord, and a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. Thou shalt be no more termed forsaken, neither shalt thou, shall thy land any, be, any more be termed desolate. But thou shalt be called Hesabah, and thy land Beulah. For the Lord delighteth in thee, and thy land shall be merry. That was Isaiah chapter 62, verses 1 through 4. Chapter 62 opens up with the assurance of God's determination to fulfill his promise to his people. God is promising not to be silent or quiet. Therefore, he will intervene and act on behalf of his people. Think about that. God will intervene and act on behalf of his people. Romans 8, Romans chapter 8, verse 31 through 39 tells us how God intervenes and acts on behalf of his people. Those verses tell us, what shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one. For God himself has given us right standing within himself, with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. And he is sitting in the place of honor of God's right hand, pleading for us. Can if anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we, if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened from death? As the scripture says, for your sake we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries for tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Those verses were Romans chapter 8, verse 31 through 39. Verse 2 of our lesson continues with chapter 61, verse 11 ends with a promise that all nations will see God's righteousness and the world leaders will be blinded by God's glory. The nations of the earth will see the marvelous transformation that will happen to Zion and will refer to Zion with a new name which God will give to Zion. You too had an old name in the, which the world called you. Your old name describes your character, but your new name describes who you accept and believe and follow, Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 11 verse 26 B tells us it was at Antioch that the believers were first called Christians. Revelations 2 and 17 tells us anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the church. To everyone who is victorious, I will give some of the manna that has been hidden away in heaven. And I will give to each one on a white stone and on the stone will be engraved a new name that no one understands except the one who is given of a new name is usually associated with a new status, a radically new situation, 
or a new characteristic or a new association. This is not a name that the foreigners will invent, nor does the individual receiving the name do some self-promotion by putting out a new sign at the city gate. God is the one who would designate the new name. And because we have received a new name, we too can offer praises. Just because we have received a new name, we still recognize the name. Philippians 2 verse 9 through 11 tells us, Therefore God elevated him to the place of the highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now we too can sing songs of praises to our God. If you're out there, let's sing together. There is a name I love to hear, I love to sing His word. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. One more time. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. Thank you all. In conclusions, Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 through 9 tells us, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. But he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due seasons we shall reap if we faint not. That was Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 through 9. May the Lord watch between me and thee while we are absent one from another. Amen.